Welcome to the ninth Indie Ref Weekly Review, bringing you a round of news you maybe missed every week until the Scottish Independence Referendum in September. This week, Parliaments, Pensions and Palestine. But first, bidding began this week on licences for fracking across the UK. Fracking is the act of drilling down into the earth and using high pressure water mixed with chemicals and sand to create such pressure that shale gas reserves are forced out of the ground. Now, not only is fracking really poor for the environment due to the massive amounts of water that needs to be transported to the extraction sites, but it's also suspected to have led to minor earthquakes, such as around Blackpool following fracking in 2011. It's also created over 280 billion gallons of toxic waste in the US last year, and there's also been evidence of methane release and contaminated wells and streams as a result. Now, the UK government has said that there would be tighter regulation to counter this, but the damage done to landscape alone in areas being fracked is worrying, especially when you consider that one of the sites currently up for licensing under Westminster is Loch Lomond. The Scottish tourism industry generates £11 billion of revenue annually and messing around with a key tourist destination seems a bit reckless. On top of this, the UK government also put forward a bill in June that will change trespass laws to allow companies to drill under your property despite a report published the previous month showing that 74% of the UK was opposed to that. See, the question now is, why this intense push for fracking despite the serious environmental concerns? It may have something to do with the fact that one third of those in the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee who are responsible for the recent report on fracking own shares in companies with connections to fracking. Or maybe it's because of Cameron's long criticised relationship with the Conservative Party's chief election strategist, Linton Crosby, who is also a lobbyist for promoting shale gas companies in Australia. Or it could be because under Cameron's most recent reshuffle, the new Environment Secretary, Elizabeth Truss, has consistently moved to reduce the investment in renewable energy. When it's estimated that Scotland has 25% of all of Europe's tidal energy potential and 10% of its wave energy, not to mention unconfirmed reports of what could be the largest oil field in the world off the west coast of Shetland, we see again that policies made by Westminster for the UK are not always what's best for the unique properties and potentials of Scotland. Remember all that talk about how there'd be more powers for Scotland if we vote no? Well, it's become even clearer over the last week that we would likely see more power taken away from the Scottish Parliament rather than given to it. Secretary of Scotland Alistair Carmichael, the principal minister representing Scotland in the UK, stated this week that in the event of a no vote, Scotland would need to be reminded that we were ruled by two parliaments, not one. Carmichael stated that once the vote is over, we have to learn the lessons of how we came to be here. Part of that process has involved the UK government not being sufficiently visible in Scotland, and we can't allow ourselves to go back to that in the future. A source close to Nick Clegg also stated that the role of the UK government would need to be enhanced in Scotland, not diminished. And this is it. There will be no extra powers in the event of a no vote. There will be punishment. It's gotten to the point now that the UK government even sees providing better services than the rest of the UK as a sign of disobedience. Recently, Lord George Fuchs of the Labour Party stated that the SNP are on a very dangerous track. What they are doing is trying to build up a situation in Scotland where the services are manifestly better than south of the border in a number of areas. Colin Mackay, who was interviewing him at the time, then asked if that was a bad thing, to which he replied, no, but they are doing it deliberately. Is that the state of politics in the UK now? That deliberately providing better services is seen as a threat or a political move and not something that is a politician's duty to fight for? Do we need to be reminded of the role of the UK government when the services being provided are better in Scotland than that of the rest of the UK? Willie Rennie, leader of the Lib Dems in Scotland, sums up the threat to the Scottish Parliament quite perfectly here. I mean, the fact that the Scottish Parliament is, is, is a temporary institution is actually quite... Uh, a fact that's not known by many people. It could be abolished by Westminster tomorrow. Um, they can legislate on anything to do with the Scottish Parliament at any time. This week in Project Fear, the ongoing campaign to keep you scared of independence, we find out that in an independent Scotland, pensions will suffer as we go through cuts of over £90 million to savings credit. And... What? Really? Turns out that's already happened under the current Westminster government. 
In fact, since 2010, over 50,000 Scottish pensioners have lost benefits, according to research from the House of Commons Library. There you go. It seems that all the scaremongering around pensions in an independent Scotland are nothing compared to what is actually happening right now. In fact, a recent report has shown that the UK has the worst pensions in Europe as well as the highest retirement age. On top of that, an inquiry to the UK Department for Work and Pensions has confirmed that independence will have no negative effects on your state pension. Even Steve Webb, the UK Pensions Minister, has acknowledged that older folk would be entitled to the current levels of state pension after a yes vote. The No campaign and right-wing media have consistently been shown to be lying when it comes to pensions in an indie Scotland. Here's the Scottish Daily Express from April of this year. You may not know that the Express publishes a different version for England than it does in Scotland. Here was their headline for England on the same day. The scare tactics around pensions are failing. Don't be fooled. We are going to do just fine after a yes vote. <laughs> And now onto the final section, it's the fact of the day. Anyone who's been following the news will be aware of the just horrific events happening just now in Gaza, with Israel constantly shelling Palestine. Since the conflict began 26 days ago, there's been over 1,600 Palestinians killed, most of civilians, many children, and over 8,000 injured. Schools have been bombed, hospitals have been bombed. The images coming from Gaza are horrendous. Israel, who are responsible for the shellings, have lost 64 soldiers and three civilians in contrast. Israel continues to shell Palestine under the name of responding to the Hamas terrorists, but are firing into civilian areas. And through this horror, this genocide, the UK government has pledged support for Israel. There have been protests across the UK. It is estimated that 15,000 people marched in London. Glasgow and Edinburgh have had massive demonstrations. Yet the UK government supports Israel. Could it be because of Westminster's horrendous foreign policy? The UK government have issued export licences for Israel so far for a value of £7.8 billion. While a lot of that is most likely being invested into communications, it's expected that at least £10 million worth of weaponry is being bought from the UK by Israel under the licences provided by the UK government's Department for Business. Why haven't the licenses been revoked? Why isn't there an embargo on trade with Israel until these war crimes have been accounted for? Then again, Westminster has a history of approving licenses to sell weapons to countries with very poor track records, including Russia, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. In contrast, the Scottish Government have pledged £500,000 in aid for Palestine and offered the services of the Scottish NHS as well as homes for refugees. Dumbarton Town Hall flies the flag of Palestine in support. When David Cameron says that the UK is supporting Israel, I have to ask, what does the UK stand for if it stands with those committing genocide? Still think we're better together? That's everything from this week's Indie Ref Weekly Review. Links to everything I've spoken about are below. If you have any questions on independence or you have an interesting news story, please do send it over to IndieRefCommunity at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at StephenPayton134. Please do share, like, and subscribe. I will see you all next week. And remember, don't hate the media. Become the media.